Hi, I want to talk to you today about one of the greatest scandals in the history of philosophy. It is David Hume's scandal of induction. Now, it's not much of a scandal as these things go. There's nothing really licentious involved in this, except that Hume is arguing that all of our reasoning about matter of fact is founded in the end on custom or habit or feeling and not on reason at all. Now, you might think that the scientific method or serious historiography, for example, or other ways of conducting inquiry in the natural or social sciences are paradigms of rationality. But Hume says actually they rest on principles that cannot be given any rational justification at all. The very modes of reasoning we use in the sciences are things that have no rational justification. In the end, they have to rest on something else. And he refers to that something else as custom or habit or sometimes feeling. And we have to be careful about that because custom, he doesn't really mean the kind of thing that varies a lot from culture to culture. It's not like that kind of custom. Habit, it's not like, well, yeah, I draw these scientific inferences much the way I might uh, get addicted to smoking or eating chocolate or something. No, it's something more fundamental. He thinks that there is a fundamental habit of mind, something that's built into the structure of the mind itself that leads us to reason in this way. But in the end, it's not really a rational foundation that these things have. Instead, science, scientific method, inductive reasoning in general, from instances to general truths, is based on little more than a feeling, a feeling of expectation that the future is going to resemble the past. So we're going to look at his arguments in detail, but it's a surprising conclusion, and I want to alert you to the scandalous nature of the conclusion before we even start on the details. It is startling. If it turns out our very paradigms of reasoning, the scientific method, the reasoning that people use in history, in the natural sciences, in the social sciences, if all of that turns out to be little more than something based on the passions, based on custom or habit or feeling, it's a rather startling conclusion. It suggests that there isn't much to rationality at all. So let's take a look at Hume's scandal of induction. I want to return to the arguments we looked at briefly when we considered Leibniz's arguments for rationalism. Because Leibniz lays out a case in favor of rationalism based on universality and necessity. Remember those two things because when we get to Immanuel Kant, those are going to be absolutely crucial. He will base his entire critique of pure reason on the idea that some of our knowledge is universal and necessary. But for now, let's again like take that for granted. Yes, we have some universal and necessary knowledge. Paradigm of it is in mathematics or the natural sciences, where we have scientific laws that talk about all objects at all times, or all points of space, or all forces. We have things that have a law like necessity. It's not just, hey, it generally happens that blah, blah, blah. But no, what goes up must come down. If you apply a force to an object, then it must accelerate, and so forth. And so we've got a real kind of necessity there. But Leibniz's argument, remember, is that all of our experience is particular and contingent. And from particular and contingent premises, we're never going to be able to justify a universal and a necessary conclusion. Here is how Leibniz himself puts it. Now, all the instances which confirm a general truth, however numerous they may be, are not sufficient to establish the universal necessity of this same truth. For it doesn't follow that what's happened will happen in the same way. So no matter how many instances we accumulate, it won't be enough to establish anything universal or anything necessary. Our experience is always of contingent matters of fact. We're looking at things that might have gone that way, might have gone some other way in terms of logic. They're not things we can prove from logic or mathematics. And so knowledge that's immediately justified by our experiences of the world, by scientific investigation, by experiments, by historical research, and so forth, all of that is knowledge of contingent matters of fact. They could have gone this way, they could have gone some other way. That's why we have to investigate. But that is never going to imply, in a non-trivial sense anyway, any necessary truth. What I mean by that non-trivial business is, okay, maybe some necessary truths will follow, things that would follow from anything, like the number one is the number one, but that's not of interest to us. Or maybe, you know, the War of 1812 was, was the War of 1812. Well, yeah, we don't need history to tell us that. But everything else is something that could have gone some other way. And there is no justification for drawing that conclusion on the basis purely of that contingent and particular experience. 
It looks like experience can't possibly justify universal or necessary truths. When we go from particular contingent facts of experience to a universal conclusion, there's obviously something else going on. And Leibniz says it's got to have to be a synthetic a priori truth, but some other premise must be added because the universal conclusion is not going to follow no matter how many particular and contingent matters of fact we refer to. It's the same thing with causal conclusions. We're never going to get a causal conclusion out of those particular contingent facts. This lightning, then that thunder. Keep piling them up. You're never going to get to the causal relationship between lightning and thunder. And the same thing with necessity. We're not going to get from contingent matters of fact to something necessary. And so Leibniz says, look, outside of purely logical truths then, we're going to need something like a universal premise to get a universal conclusion. We're going to need a necessary premise to get a necessary conclusion. And we're not getting those from experience. If we're getting them at all, they're coming from somewhere else. Well, if they're coming from somewhere else, other than experience, they must be a priori. If they depended on experience, they'd be a posteriori. To say they're coming from someone else, somewhere else means that they are not resting on experience. They must be a priori. But they have to be really about the world. They can't just be verbal or the things that would follow from them are just trivial. So they've got to be synthetic, really truths about the world. So Leibniz says we need synthetic a priori principles to get us from those particular con contingent facts to a universal conclusion, to a causal conclusion, or to a necessary conclusion. Now so far, you might wonder, and here I'll use an example that is going to be important for thinking about Hume as well. Suppose I take some object and I toss it into the air. You would expect it to come down. Tom Brady throws a pass. It comes down. It does, doesn't go into orbit, but it comes down to a receiver. And a baseball player hits a ball. It goes up but then it comes down. It would be very strange if the center fielder went over to catch the ball and the ball just hung in space and never came down. And indeed, we can observe lots of instances of things going up and coming down. Here's something going up, coming down. Well, we can look at this and we can describe various instances of this. And so we can say, aha, instance one. <laughs> this goes up, this comes down. Inst instance two, ditto three, ditto, and so forth. And whether we're talking about footballs or basketballs or baseballs or this mask that I keep tossing, well, no matter what we talk about here, things are going up, things are coming down, but it's still all contingent matters of fact. Now notice it is contingent because it's something that I can't establish on the basis of logic. It's not a truth of logic that if I toss this in the air, it has to come down. It's something that is really a matter of fact. So it is something that is contingent. And it is also something that's particular. This mass going up at this moment comes down. And I can do that as many times as I want. I can keep racking up all these instances. I'm still getting things that are particular and contingent. So any logical conclusion I draw from these that isn't just some logical truth that's independent of all that anyway, anything that really depends on this in any fashion, is going to have to be also particular. It's going to have to be contingent. Now, it might include lots of things. It might be, hey, look, lots and lots of things go up and then come down. Yes, that's fair enough. Many times this happens. And indeed, if our conclusion in science was just, hey, you know, a lot of times you throw something up and it comes down. A lot of times you apply a force and something accelerates. But, but that's not what we do. We come up with conclusions that we think are scientific laws, that are meant to be universal, that are meant to be necessary. We talk about causation. And whenever we do that, we realize, hold on a second, if I get an all here, <laughs> or I get a necessarily, or I suggest that what I'm doing is deriving some kind of law, or I talk about causation, all of those are things that can't possibly come from this alone. So add up as many of these as you want, keep multiplying the instances, I will still never get to that. I will still never get to the conclusion that everything that goes up must come down. I will never get to the conclusion that every time you apply a force, the thing accelerates, and so forth. So it looks like I need something else. That argument all by itself is not enough. 
for me to say, aha, that conclusion is rationally justified. If there is a rational justification, and Leibniz assumes there is. Now notice here, there's a really important point. Leibniz says, of course, science must be rational, mathematics must be rational. And so, of course, there's a rational justification. So it's got to be coming from somewhere, namely a synthetic a priori principle. But Hume will say, well, wait, <laughs> what if there is no rational justification? What if we don't have those synthetic a priori principles? And actually, there's nothing there. That's the best it is, right? That's the whole bit of the reasoning. I just have something happening a lot of times. And then my mind jumps to the fact that, hey, it always happens, and it's got to happen, and something's causing it to happen. But there's no rational justification for that at all. That's possible. And that's what worries Hume. Maybe, like Leibniz, we say, well, I guess there's something else that makes all this rational. Or maybe we say, eh, there isn't. Nothing makes it rational. So Leibniz is going to say, we move from the particular to the universal in induction. We go from instances to a generalization. But what justifies the move? Well, it doesn't follow. It's not logic. I can't establish on the basis of logic that because this has happened before, it's going to happen the next time. Well, the rationalist is going to say, as Leibniz does, there must be some innate idea, some innate principle that gets me from the particular to the universal, from the contingent to the necessary. But Hume says nothing does. Actually, that blank, step two in the collect underpants, blank, profits. Here, contingent, particular matters of fact, blank, universal necessary, law-like conclusion. Ha! Nothing goes in there. There is no way of getting from one to the other. So Hume gives us some examples of inductive inferences like this. All observed ravens have been black, so all ravens are black. When I've eaten bread, I've found it nourishing, so bread is nourishing. When the sun sets, it rises the next morning, so the sun always rises. Those are inductive inferences based on generalizations from past experience, and that makes sense. All of them are entirely reasonable inferences we ordinarily think, but Hume says, well, be careful. What do we mean by reasonable? Yes, we do this, we routinely do this, and I'm not suggesting we do otherwise, Hume makes it clear. But on the other hand, uh, what makes it reasonable? What does reason have to do with it? He says, let's look for a justification of this kind of inductive generalization. It can't be a priori. It is not necessary. The next raven might be white. The next time I eat bread, it might poison me. The next time I toss the mask in the air, it might just somehow hang up there suspended in space. It is not a priori at all that it's going to continue in the same way. And we can show that by looking at cases where we had inductive generalizations that were very well supported and then turned out not to be true. Newton's laws of motion are a good example. As Einstein showed, accelerate things to close to the speed of light, and Newton's principles don't work anymore. And so you have to do something to change the laws. We had excellent empirical support in favor of a variety of Newtonian laws of motion. The whole theory of Newtonian mechanics seemed very well grounded on experience. But then Einstein showed, well, here's this new kind of experience. This new kind of thing, light, doesn't really work the way Newton predicted that it would work. And something similar happened when biologists found black swans in the middle of Australia. They had thought all swans were white because all observed swans were white. Reasonable conclusion, until you find a black swan. And things happen like that all the time. In politics, people are constantly saying, well, look at prior elections. The pattern has always been this, so this is what's going to happen the next time. And often they turn out to be wrong. Hey, this happened for the first time. Well, OK, that, that happens. So in short, the future doesn't always resemble the past. And so it's not a question of this being a priori. It happens all the time that things go wrong and that we get a surprise. Well, then let's conclude that it's a posteriori. Ah, Hume says that won't work either. Why won't it work? Well, it's very simple. We'd have to appeal to experience. If it's a posteriori, it's dependent on experience. So we'd say, well, here's why I trust inductive inference. Here's why it's reasonable. It usually has worked out in the past. But now you can say, wait, that, that's just like the all observed swans have been white, therefore all swans are white. Yeah, induction has always worked out in the past, so it's going to work out next time. Well, what if it doesn't? I mean, that's just another inductive generalization. And so any justification using that would be circular. 
Besides, it turns out it doesn't always work out. We find black swans. Black swans occur. And so, I mean, now a black swan is just a term for any surprising event, something that in retrospect looks predictable, but actually we didn't have experience of anything like that. And so, in fact, it took everyone by surprise. Well, that happens all the time. So the justification can't be a priori, because we do get surprised sometimes, and it can't be a posteriori. That's just what it, it, what's at issue. We can't appeal to experience to justify appeals to experience. So Hume says in the end, look, any attempt to justify this is going to run into a circle. All arguments concerning existence are founded on the relation of cause and effect, he says, and our knowledge of that relation is derived entirely from experience. All our experimental conclusions proceed on the supposition that the future will resemble the past. We do some experiments, we conduct some observations, we do some research, we say, hey, in all these instances we've observed, it's gone like this. So in all instances, in the future as well as the past, it will go like this, and it has to go like this. Hume says, uh, <laughs> don't draw that conclusion. What if the, form, the future doesn't conform to the past? Maybe it won't this time. And indeed, since we do get surprised periodically, it doesn't always. To endeavor, therefore, the proof of this last supposition by probable arguments, Hume argues, or arguments regarding existence, must be evidently going in a circle and taking for granted what is the very point in question. Why should we think the future will resemble the past? Even in general, let alone in any particular respect, like with respect to things going up and coming down, after all, that seemed like an inviolable law of nature until we were able to put things into orbit, until we were able to actually accelerate something to the point where it would stay up there. And so that's something really never conceived before a certain point when we developed the technology to be able to accelerate things to high velocities. And something similar happened with Newton's laws. As soon as we were able to observe what was going on near the speed of light or at the speed of light, we realized, wait, <laughs> something very fundamentally different is happening. So the future doesn't always resemble the observed past. And it won't help to say, well, it has up to now. <laughs> I mean, not only does, hasn't it always, but even when it has, I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah, you're just appealing to the same point. That's a circular justification. Well, how can we get out of the circle? I call this next move Hume's tangent, a way of getting out of the circle and trying to come to some kind of conclusion. He says, after the constant conjunction of two objects, heat and flame, for existence, for instance, or weight and solidity, we're determined by custom alone to expect the one from the appearance of the other. This hypothesis seems even the only one which explains the difficulty why we draw from a thousand instances an inference which we're not able to draw from one instance that is in no respect different from them. Reason is incapable of any such variation. The conclusions which it draws from considering one circle are the same it would form on surveying all the circles in the universe. But no man, having seen only one body move after being impelled by another, could infer that every other body will move after a like impulse. All inferences from experience, therefore, are effects of custom, not of reasoning. So in mathematics, we can look at one circle and come up with theorems on the basis of it and conclude something about all circles, because we've abstracted away from all of the particular contingent aspects of the situation. But in experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence in the natural sciences and the social sciences, we're not doing that. We're talking about the real world. And we can't abstract from all the contingency and all the particularity. That's a vital part of it. So how do we get to any conclusion that is necessary or universal? Answer is we can't. At least we can't rationally. If we're doing it, we're doing it in some non-rational fashion. And here is term for that is custom. But again, not necessarily a social or cultural custom, really just a custom or habit of the human mind. We do that because the mind is built to, that way. We naturally do that. It's not that we have to learn through our culture to take certain things that have happened in experience and expect them in the future. It's part of human nature. Hence, his book is called A Treatise of Human Nature. But it's not a rational thing. There is no rational justification for it. So here's an example of the kind of argument that he's concerned about. We see one flame that's hot. We conclude that all, all flames are hot. That would be absurd, right? I can't meet one student and conclude something about all students or look at one bug and conclude something about all bugs. But if I see repeated instances and see the same thing, this flame is hot, that flame's hot, that one is too, and so on, 
then I do conclude all flames are hot and I think that's reasonable. That seems acceptable. So how is that possible? Let's go back to my tossing <laughs> something in the air. What goes up must come down. Well, I do it once. Let's say there's a baby who is really, you know, quite young, has never seen this kind of thing before, and I do this in front of the baby. The baby's going, ah, right? Surprise, okay? Will the baby conclude that every time something's tossed, it's going to come back down? Well, no, right? Might or might not. And so the baby won't form any expectation, but repeated often enough, we do form that expectation. And yet, if you look at the details of what we're doing, we're just saying, well, up, down, up, down, up, down. <laughs> and it doesn't seem like I'm giving you any new information. That's why Hume says, look, nothing new is going on, right? And indeed, it gets boring very quickly. If I say, go, mass goes up, mass goes down, mass goes up, mass goes down. Suppose I were to continue that for the next 45 minutes. <laughs> Here's a um, fast forward, bored now, <laughs> this is crazy. And you're not learning anything new, that's the point. So in short, there's nothing rationally that's going to take you to this that wasn't there already in the first thing. The more I repeat it, the more I'm just boring you. I'm not giving you any new information. And so nothing new about the world is really justifiable on the basis of that. Now it would be different if I could survey all the possible instances of this. Let's say there are 50 states in the United States. I survey every one of them. And I say, okay, Montana is like this, and Vermont is like this, Alabama is like this, and so on. I conclude all the states are like this. Where I've got a limited finite collection, okay, I can do that. But when I've got in principle a kind of unlimited thing, like tossing things in the air and catching them again, seeing them come down, well, that's not the kind of thing that's limited in that way. It's like, oh, well, we just did it. Those are all the possible mass talking, tossings. We're done surveying that. It's not like that. And so we really aren't learning anything new here. And so there is nothing rational that can derive a universal or a necessary or a causal conclusion from a mass of these that wasn't present in the first one. So what's happening? It's not something that is rational at all. It's not some synthetic a priori principle. It's not some analytic principle. That would just give us logical truths. It's not some a posteriori principle. Then we'd say, well, what's the justification for that? And we'd look to another inductive argument and would be in some kind of infinite regress. So in the end, Hume says, we get taken out of rationality at all. All of these moves that will take us to this kind of conclusion that really is about the world and not merely a logical truth has to rest on something outside the realm of reason altogether. Because it needs some kind of rational justification, presumably, but that couldn't go on to infinity. And so there must be something outside rationality itself that in the end gives us some principle of justification. Or let's say not a principle, but explains the move. And that's what he says. Look, I'm not going to justify this. I don't think there is a rational justification. In the end, what's going on is the source is from something outside reason. And it's a source, since it's not a rational source, that isn't really a justification. It's just something we do. <laughs> it's a habit of ours. It's a custom of the mind. It is a feeling that's produced, a feeling of expectation that the next one is going to be just the same. And so in the end, it isn't reason at all. So Hume gives us what is known as a skeptical solution. There simply is no rational justification for inductive inference. It's based on habit or custom. It's not based on reason at all. Well, I said that's a scandal, and it does seem like a scandal, but co contemporary philosophers have developed other scandals that are closely related to it. One of my own teachers, Carl Hempel, is responsible for this one. It's called the Raven's Paradox, and it's a bit of an extension of what Hume is talking about here. All observed ravens have been black. So all ravens are black. That's an example of something that Hume himself gives. That's an example of an inductive inference. It seems reasonable. It seems to be based on evidence. But of course, if Hume is right, it's not really based on evidence at all. Hempel points out there's another sort of problem. All observed non-black things have been non-ravens. That's actually equivalent to saying all observed ravens have been black. So what if we conclude that all non-black things are non-ravens? That's equivalent logically to the claim that all ravens are black. Well, that inference doesn't seem very reasonable. It doesn't seem to be based on evidence. If I go around and look at things in the world that are not black and say, aha, here's one, this mask is not black and it's not a raven. 
So that's evidence that all ravens are black. These keys, huh, they're not black. And they're not ravens. More evidence. What about this sheet of paper? It's yellow. Huh, it's not black. And it's not a raven. And so on. It looks like I'm not adding to the evidence that all ravens are black. You gotta look at ravens for that. You can't look at all these things that are other colors. And so, why not though? It looks like, wait a minute, but the claim that all non-black things are non-ravens is just equivalent to the claim that all ravens are black. So why isn't evidence for the one evidence for the other? Well, bizarre. Hempel says, it's hard to explain this. Hume would say, well, I already told you, it's not a question of reason. And so this is the way our habits of mind work. And yeah, it's in this way, it looks hmm, a little puzzling. I don't know, maybe we can give an explanation, but at least it's a sort of puzzle that it's hard to solve on purely rational grounds. Here's another one, which Nelson Goodman came up with. It's called the Grew Paradox. Say that something is Grew if it's green before some future time, let's say January 1st, 2050, and blue after that. Well, that means that all evidence we now have that a thing is green would also count as evidence that it's Grew. But it seems reasonable to conclude that it's green and not that it's Grew. It's not like you think, well, okay, this thing is green, so I, you know, it's Grew, so I, I fully expect that on January 1st, 2050, it's going to start looking blue to us. <laughs> that would be bizarre, right? We conclude it's green, not that it's Grew and that it's likely to change color at some future date. But why? What's our justification for that? Well, in a way, Goodman's point is we don't have a rational justification for that. We choose certain properties that seem natural to us and use those in our inductive inferences. We talk about ravens. We talk about things having colors. We talk about, in this case, well, green and blue. But we don't talk about these odd gerrymandered things like Gru or some set of things that consists of the UT Tower and the number one and the country of Burundi. We don't try to form generalizations about that collection. Why not? Well, Goodman says, I don't think that's rational either. So in short, there are all sorts of scandals about induction. It doesn't seem to have any rational foundation, Hume points out. And then Hempel and Goodman point out, actually the details of how we do it are even more puzzling. Because if you say, well, it's not just that move from contingent and particular to universal and necessary. It's the way, very terms we allow ourselves to use in doing that move, then it seems even worse. So in short, it looks like our rational, or our, well, you might say paradig paradigmatically rational ways of thinking in the natural sciences, in the social sciences, just through inductive generalizations in ordinary life, have no rational foundation at all. In the end, they're based on custom, habit, feeling, not on reason. And that's a startling conclusion. I close with green or blue or grew cats.